Hallelujah. Welcome back to the 11th hour. Oh, it's the place where we come to hear God to make 11th hour decisions. Decisions in this time we live in to believe. There has to be a point in time where we make our choice to believe. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. How we bless the Lord. Now, I want us to, uh, well, let's lift our hands and thank him a minute before we jump into this. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the anointing. And we thank you, Lord God, for all you're doing today and what you're doing here on the 11th hour. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want you to, uh, you got your Bibles with you. I want you to, um, I want you to open them up. Let's see where we want to go to. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's, let's look at just a few things here today. And uh, I think the Holy Ghost has done a lot that he wanted to do already. Don't you? I think so. Amen. Um, let's look at, we're going to look at 2 Samuel in a few moments, but I want to look at this right, right now. And I want to see the word revolution. Now, we've been talking a lot about a revolution. There's going to be a revolution, a Jesus revolution. There's going to be a radical move uh, toward God. We're going to, there's going to be a revival, I believe, that started in the, in the late 60s, ended in the early 70s, but it never really ended. It just went on pause. And I believe religion tried to stop it forever, but it's not going to be able to. And one, one reason you know you're close at hand is because you see prophets attacked so hard. The prophetic is being attacked. It's always attacked before the glory, before the promise arrives. You know, before Jesus came, John the Baptist was persecuted to no ends. I mean, it was just horrible the way they would come out there and you know they laughed at him and he called him a brood of vipers and he was dealing with a political and a lot of things that went on and, and different things but he he received persecution and but he said the ones coming after me he said oh my goodness what's about to happen he said i can't even unloose his sandals i'm not even worthy to do that so this is the revolution that's coming there has to be a great revival of the jesus culture Maybe, <laughs> maybe, I don't know if that's the right words, but it's a revolution. Now, we speak of a Jesus revolution. Now, what does it mean? It means uh, we come to a place where you have invited Jesus into your heart. Now, this is the way it starts. You invite Jesus into your heart, and... Uh, by making him the Lord of your life. And that's the, that's the way you invite him in your heart. And you do that by simply saying, Jesus, I believe God raised you from the dead, and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. <clears throat> and if you'll do that and mean it with all your heart, he'll come into your heart and give you a brand new life. Now, it starts with that knowledge, and that will never change. He is the only way to heaven. Now, we need to get that in our thinking now. We need to quit, quit saying, calling God the universe, and we need to quit saying there's many ways to, to heaven. There's not. There's only one way, <clears throat> and his name is Jesus. Jesus didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, I am a life. He said, I am the only way, I'm the only truth, and I'm the only life. He is God in the flesh. And so without receiving him as your Lord and Savior as his, and the sacrifice he paid for us, there is a devil's hell that you will have to spend eternity in <clears throat> because there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. So you want to gain heaven and shun hell right now. Hallelujah. And you do that first of all. Now this begins the revolution. 
And once the revolution begins, <clears throat> now, I want you to, to listen to me. You will think differently. It means that, that the God that created the whole universe has come to take up residence in you. And you, you think differently. Eventually, you will talk differently because now you perceive differently. And perception, uh, uh, the world a man perceives, is the world the man lives in. And so you have to, you know, this begins the revolution. Now, I want to talk to you real quickly about the story of two falls during this revolution. Now, when Lucifer fell and became Satan, this is the first fall. When he fell and became Satan, he did it over the jealousy he had for the man. Now, the God of the universe, the God, the only God, the one that created it all. Now, he, when he created Adam, he wasn't just making a man. He was duplicating himself. He was creating his family. Now, the only thing above this family was going to be himself. And it is. The only thing higher class that, that, that's, in a, that's higher than a man is God because God created the man. And so then God can only be the source, can only, is the only source that can fulfill a man's every need because everything else falls below his status. And you, people say, well, I don't know about that. That's because you're looking at fallen man. You're not looking at the way man was created. Now, man, see, you were born into a world you were not created to live in. You were born into a fallen world, but you were created to live in the world Adam lived in before the fall. And that's why things get so frustrating. You can see people die. People leave this world, and you know in your heart that's not right. You'll say, that's not right. We should be able to do something about that. Yes, Yes, because it's a foreign entity that came into this earth. And the Bible says death is the last enemy that will be put under man's feet. So it's an enemy to a man. Death, people say, oh, you know, death, just embrace death. It's all a part of life. No, it's not a part of life. It's the opposite of life. Have you ever noticed that death is not a part of life? It's the ending of it. It's the ending of a physical life. And so it's not a part of life. Now, I want you to see some things today, and we'll go on into this, that now Satan became jealous. Lucifer became jealous, and he fell because of the jealousy he had for the man that was coming. He was prideful, and he thought uh, no one should occupy space between him and God but him. No one else should be above him. When he discovered the man that was coming, <clears throat> when he discovered that and he saw that, that anointing that was on him taught him what that man's position entailed, and it infuriated him to the point that he took it to the high court of heaven. Now, when you see Psalm 8, then you start to realize when you look at Psalm 8 and you see it in Hebrews 2, then you see the same psalm is quoted in Hebrews 2. But in Hebrews 2 in the New Testament, it gives you clarity on who said that. It was an angel who said that. And David being a prophet heard that. But David was also a prophet and he was hearing the position of the man. And that's what Lucifer heard that infuriated him so. See, in, in the world before Adam, when God created it all, he absolutely, he made everything that is. And he lived outside of that and made it. And Isaiah 40 talks about how he created it in his hand. And he held the waters and measured them in the hollow of his hand. And he meted out the heavens with a span. And the Hebrew says a nine-inch span. He, he measured it all. He calculated everything. He said the nations were just like a drop of dust in the buckets of the balance. He weighed the mighty mountains and hills in a, in a balance. He, he absolutely knew 
everything and created it all. And the dust in a measure. So when he did this and he he created it to be inhabited, Isaiah 45 says. He said he didn't make it in vain. That means void. He made it to be inhabited. Something happened and caused it to fall. And that was Lucifer's rebellion. And that rebellion came over the, the place of the man. See, in those days, the Scripture talks about in Ezekiel 28 that there were stones of fire. And he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. These are revelations of God that God placed. And he anointed this angelic creature. Now, I want you to listen close to what I'm telling you. He anointed this angelic creature, this one called Lucifer, our light bearer. And his word, the entrance of his word brings light. And the scripture says in the New Testament that, that Jesus is the bright and morning star. And Lucifer is called son of the morning in Isaiah 14. In other words, Lucifer was Jesus' personal angel because Jesus is the word, the light, and he would bring the light into the world, getting it ready for God's family that would soon arrive. And he would walk up and down in these revelations, these fiery revelations of the knowing of God. And he would see one brightly shine up. And he would pick that revelation up. And the anointing that was on in the scripture said he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the one. And the scripture talks about how when he fell, he said, I'll ascend through the heights of the clouds, showing he was on the earth. He was here to establish what God was going to bring. And he would sing in frequencies. The scripture says that, that in Job, that when God laid the foundations of the earth, that the sons of God or the angels of God shouted for shout into the earth because the earth is put together with harmonious frequencies and it's put together with sound and sound and frequencies. Everything has a frequency and the angelic host would shout for joy and the joy of the Lord would begin to prepare the earth for what God was going to release into it. And so Lucifer was the only anointed one to go up and down in these stones, and he would find a revelation. And the Scripture says in Ezekiel he had these timbrels built into him, these tambourines that would, that would make a sound and, and instead of a heart. And he had these pipes that came forth from his being. And he would lift himself up, and he would begin to sing the revelation. He was anointed with a prophetic anointing, to operate on an angel. This is why the prophetic scares him so. It's because he knew that's what was used to bring the revelations of God in prophetic song into the earth. I know this sounds heavy. Oh, this is heavy, Brother Robin. It's about to get heavier. So he, he, he comes and he would lift himself up and sing. And the day came, he was walking up and down in the stones of fire, and the bright revelation of the image of God came. And the earth had to prepare itself. Why? Because his body would be made out of the dust. And so the frequencies, the earth, everything had to be ready for God's family. Because as soon as that body was formed, and he breathed that spirit into him, it was going to connect heaven and earth together, walking in that man. And that man would be known as the son of God, Adam, Adam, the blood covenant, <clears throat> son of the living God. Luke 3 declares Adam was his son. Now, <clears throat> so we, we see this, and when Lucifer saw that revelation, the scripture says the anointing will teach you all things. So when he picked that revelation up, the anointing on him began to tell him all the man's potential, all of it. Now remember, he's anointed with a prophetic anointing. You know that because of the timbrels and the pipes and the song. That's where we get the idea that Lucifer was the chief praise angel. 
And by the way, Isaiah 40 is where we get the idea when he measured out the waters in his hand that where he holds the whole world in his hand. So all of these things are in the Scripture. And when Lucifer saw the potential of the man, he goes to the court of heaven. And Hebrews 2 says, a certain angel earnestly protested about that. And he quotes Psalm 8. So this, this anointed cherub goes to the court of heaven. Now you have to remember something. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you this now. I want you to listen. An angel is not an officer of the court. An angel is a reaper of harvest. Matthew 13, Jesus said, angels are the reapers. That's who Jacob saw going up that ladder, coming down that ladder, taking up seed, bringing back harvest. You'll find when Satan went up before the Lord, all capitals, Lord, to get Job's harvest, he said, where have you come from? He said, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the, the ladder Jacob saw was a helix-type spiral. It was the DNA of man because man is God's family. So these angels would go get harvest, bring it back. And Jacob said, man, this is the gateway to heaven, and I will give a tithe of everything I have. So you see that, and Lucifer went before the, the court of heaven but he's not an officer, but the anointing of a prophet who is an officer of the court. The anointing of the prophetic upon him gave him access to that courtroom. And he stepped into it as more than a reaper. He stepped into it and earnestly protested the court of heaven for your position. He didn't like that. It bothered him that you were going to be created in the image of God that puts you above an angelic creature, and he knew that. So he used the prophetic anointing to go into the court, not to get harvest, but to earnestly protest. This probably left the court stunned when he walked in, and he began to mouth off. Put up Psalm 8 on the screen. And he began to earnestly protest these words. He said, what is a man? Psalm 8. He said, what is a man that you're mindful of him? And what is the son of man that you would visit him? This was his protest. Now he's saying what he learned the man was. This is what the revolution is going to bring back to the people, to God's family, who they are in Him. What is a man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would visit him? So you made him a little lower than the angels. But that word angels there is not the word for Michael and Gabriel. It's the word for Elohim said, you made him a little lower than you. You crowned him with glory and honor. said, you made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. And we find out that he made the sun, moon, and stars with his fingers. So he had dominion over the sun, moon, and stars. And over all the works of your hands, you've put all things under his feet. All sheep, oxen, yea, the beast of the field the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And he closed the court session. Look how he opened it. Verse 1. Put that back up. Look how he opened it. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of your enemies that you might still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And then he started. What is a man? Who is this creature? 
Go back again to verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Watch. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings have you ordained strength because of your enemies that you might steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you would visit him? And he goes on, for you made him a little lower than you. He's talking about his dominion. He's talking about his authority reaches above the heavens into the depth of the sea. You think that's not true? Look at how Adam operated before he fell. He named the animals. That don't mean he just gave them a name. Your name is, is Butch and Chuck and, and Sarah and this. He didn't say, that's not what he's saying. He gave them their authority, the name. One of the ancient Hebrews teachings says that God formed, the Lord formed their bodies and Adam called forth the life in them. This is what kind of authority he walked in. And that's what scared the enemy so. And he protested earnestly about that. And all the other angels stood in dumb silence. They couldn't believe. Because even though he was anointed with a prophetic anointing, and that gave him access to go into the court of heaven and speak, because a prophet is an officer of that court to bring the court of heaven into the realm of men. Angels can be brought into that court. Paul said you would judge them. So you can bring, you'll only judge yours. And so you can bring that anointing that was on him went into the court of heaven, but he was not a man and the words he was earnestly protesting over was he actually brought God on the courtroom floor. He had no right to challenge the word of the living God. He was only anointed with a prophetic anointed to sing the word of God, not to challenge it. You don't try God in his court. And so... The day came, he was to sing the song he found in the stones of fire concerning the man. Well, I've never heard anything like that, Brother Rob. And it's time you did because religion don't want you to hear things like this. And if you want to know what scares religion, it's dominion. It scares religion. When the dominion of the Lord is, is waked up on the inside of his people and they can speak again and they know him and they know him intimately and he's their father, they're his children. When they know the covenant of the blood of the master that he shed and poured out to give you authority. No wonder he said to us, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he said, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Cast out demons. He starts talking about the same dominion he walked in. Religion don't want that. They don't want you to have that. So, when it came time to come to the earth and lift himself up because of the beauty of the holiness he walked in and spread his cherub wings and let the tambourines beat and the shofars blow with the anointed wind of the Spirit that would come of off of that revelation and sing to the earth about the man. We find it in, in Isaiah 14, in verse 12, put that up there. And when he comes to sing, and it comes time to sing, and all the earth is standing waiting on the next precious word from the Lord. 
because Jeremiah 4 talks about it and says there were mountains, there were hills, there were fruitful places, there were cities, but there was no man. No man. So everything was prepared. And now the song of God's family was coming. And the dust was going to be prepared for God himself to cast his own image underneath the wet earth. And Lucifer dared go to the court and challenge God about the authority of the man that was made a little lower than him. He would be the one to shadow the man. And so it come time to sing. The earth was ready. Lucifer, the light bearer, the music started playing, and he was ready to sing in the creation of the earth, probably standing, waiting on the beautiful sound of the word of the Lord. Suddenly the music turned dark, and it wasn't light and happy like today. It began to turn dark, and the frequencies, don't tell me frequencies don't matter. Don't tell me that because everything has a frequency and you can play certain music and hang. They've, ha they've, they've, they've hung an egg, a raw egg in front of speakers in certain uh, concerts and music and the certain music and the decimals of sound hard-boiled the egg. And everything was ready to hear the sweet sound and the earth was ready. We're ready. The whole earth and its vibrations was ready to get itself prepared for God's family. They finally get to see who was going to occupy all this. Because they knew God didn't need it. Angels knew they didn't need it. But now there's here it comes. And when the music started, he said this. Listen to how Isaiah talks about this. Verse 12, I think it is. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. See, he's Jesus' personal angel, Jesus the morning star. He said, you son of the morning, how art you cut down to the ground? which didst weaken the nations. Remember, in Isaiah 40, he had the nations as the drop of a bucket, little specks of dust. This was all prophetic. He carried that anointing. Next verse. He says, for you said in your heart, and here it was, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Did you notice this? He didn't say, I will be the most high. He said, I'll be like him. He's talking about the man. That was the song for the man. Go back to verse uh, yeah, I will ascend above, above the heights of the clouds. That's how man could operate. That's the way Adam could do. I will be like the Most High. Back on up another verse. For you said in your, I will ascend into heaven. Adam could do that. I'll exalt my throne above the stars or the angels of God. Well, we found out in the eighth Psalm that his authority was above the moon and stars and the angels. Adam would sit upon the mount of the congregation with the Lord in the sides of the north. But Lucifer turned it on himself. And the music darkened and he sang the song of the man into the earth about himself. And he established, and that's what imploded the first world. And he established because it was anointed. And angels can reap harvest. And he sowed the seed for an antichrist that would come one day. And that's the seed of the serpent. And that's what's talked about in Genesis 3. And I know that's all heavy on the 11th hour. But man, all of it is designed today to show you what the revolution is going to bring back to you. The knowledge of these things. Hallelujah. The second fall. The second fall was the fall of man. The first fall was Lucifer. 
The second fall was the fall of Adam. That was the second fall. When man was created, he was created and came into this world. Now I want you to listen close to this. When he came into this world, he came in here with an enemy already in the planet. He was created and there was already an enemy. It was already there. That's why the Lord told him. He said, you have dominion and you subdue. He tells him that he has, uh, put up verse uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And let's take a look at that on the second fall. And God said, let us create man in our image after our likeness. In other words, let him have the ability to reveal God and reflect God. He said, in our image, our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That was what the eighth psalm said he had. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish, because it used to be plentished. Now you replenish the earth, but then he adds this, Subdue it. There's an enemy out there. And he told him, You were created into a world where you're, you already have an enemy. And you have to put him under your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know I've got to hurry. I, I want you to, to catch hold of some of this. So he told Adam to have dominion and subdue. Put all things under your feet. There's an enemy out there. This is the story of how he fell. In, in the story of how he fell is in the story of the good Samaritan. That's the story of how he fell. So he was, Jesus, you remember the man asked him, he said, in Luke uh, 10, he said, and I think in verse 25 it begins. I wrote this down in Luke 10, 25. And it begins and he says that a certain uh, uh, lawyer stood up and tempted him or tested him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He said, you're a lawyer. How do you read it? Because however you read it, it's what you get out of it. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, You answered right, this do and you'll live. But the Holy Ghost told the man's heart and said he wanted to justify himself or make himself right. He said to Jesus, Who's my neighbor? Now Jesus has got to answer this. Why can't he make himself right and who's his neighbor? And he starts telling him the story. But it's not a parable because he said it was a certain man. He's telling the story of Adam's fall. Adam's lived in where we know as Jerusalem. He left headed to Jericho. The Jews taught that Satan's throne set on the moon, and Jericho means the moon. So where was he going? He was going to subdue. He was going down there to subdue. But on the way down there, he fell among thieves. And when he starts talking about this in the Greek, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. It talks about the words, speech. They talk to him. They begin to persuade him. They begin to pull him over. They begin to get into his head. They st and, and one of the, the definitions talks about in all of these words, it said they wore him down. They wore him out. It's the same tactics of today. They wore him out. And he said he fell among them, but the Greek says he fell in, lighted among them. They won him over to them. And he said they wounded him, left him half dead, knowing good and evil. And the priest came by, a Levite came by that way. Certain priests passed. They couldn't save him. The priesthood couldn't fix it. The Levitical law couldn't fix it. But a certain Samaritan came in his journey, poured in oil and wine. A Samaritan's a half Jew. His mother's Jewish, but his daddy's something else. 
Jesus' mama was Jewish, Mary, but his daddy is God Almighty. And he said it took that one to come and save the man. And so you see that the priesthood couldn't save it. Levitical law couldn't save it. Religion cannot save you. It won't even regard you. As a matter of fact, religion makes you believe that you're unclean and unworthy and you're not even willing, to, they're not willing to lay their hands on you. They're not even willing to touch you. But that one that came in his journey is. And that's what the revolution will bring. It will bring people that don't, that they love each other. They actually do. They really do. They look at each other like all the disciples in the book of Acts where they had all things common and they come together and they really love one another. But religion hates love. So it will hate them. But it don't change the revolution that's coming. It's still going to come. Some churches will shut their door and not let them in. Some will, will have nothing to do with them and turn their back. There will be priesthoods that will walk on the other side and turn and go the opposite. Levitical people that's caught up in the law will go the other direction. It will take those who follow the master, those who really believe what he said. That's what's going to, to be in that revolution. It's going to be there to the place to where you're going to see things you've never seen. Crippled legs that are crooked will begin to straighten out. Because when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Love is the perfect thing. And that will come. And when it comes, you're going to see things that you've never seen before. You're going to see cripples walk, blind see, deaf hear. You're going to see it not just here and there and somewhere. It's going to be on a regular basis. It's going to be like everyday stuff. And then all at once in the middle of it, you see hippies and, and people like that come along and they'll go into funeral homes and raise the dead. And it's going to separate religion from relationship at that point. And still, they'll just smile because they actually love each other. You're going to see homosexuals be born again and radically turned on to God. People that they said could never come out of that lifestyle. They'll not only love God, they'll get baptized in the Holy Ghost and they'll marry and have children. You're going to see drug addicts suddenly, they can't get high, and they'll take that needle and throw it down somewhere and step on it because Holy Ghost begins to fill their veins and fill their bodies and begin to come up on them, and they'll say, Dear God, why didn't somebody show me this all those years ago? And you're going to see that happen because in this revolution to come, resurrection power is what's going to show up. The glory of God, the glory of God is going to show up. Now I want you to think about something. In the scripture it says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be called equal with God. Oh my God in heaven, how can you ever say, how could we ever be called equal with God? Do you realize what he's talking about? He's talking about on the equality level of sin. How can he say that? He said, let this mind be in you. How can you say that? Because there will come a people who actually believe that the blood of Jesus washed their sin away. And they stand in His righteousness. You shouldn't think it's robbery to be called a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He did that for us. And that's the mind He wants to get in you. That you can stand before God. And you stand before heaven as if you never sinned. Yeah, but I'll make a mistake. What if I make a mistake? There ain't no what if about it. But if you do, and when you do mess up, 
don't listen to, don't listen to people tell you that 1 John 1, 9 is not for you. That's part of the covenant. He says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from the unrighteousness. So when you mess up, run to him and do what 1 John 1, 9 says and then stand up as if you never did it because you believe the blood was that powerful, that strong. And until we learn to do that, you're not going to be ready for a revolution in the spirit. Because you're going to always try to get yourself good enough before you can join this army. It's like Paul Revere riding. The British is coming. The British is coming. The British is coming. Two arms, two arms, he would say. But I want to tell you something. There's a call going out from prophets right now. The glory is coming, the glory is coming, the glory is coming. Get ready, get ready, get yourself ready, trim your lamps, get everything going. This get ready to walk in what Jesus paid for. One day you'll see somebody walk on water and it'll be caught on camera. And when it does and they're asked, they won't be somebody showing off. It'll just be caught on camera. And they'll say, are you this? Are you that? They'll say, no, Jesus is everything. And I took him at his word. And if it takes, you say, why did he walk on water? Because his disciples were in trouble. They were in trouble. They were rowing. They were toiling. They were struggling. And he just walked out across the water and went to them. But still he would have passed them by if they hadn't have said, Master, there's all kinds of people in trouble today who won't call Master. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to believe what Jesus accomplished on the cross in becoming our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. Now you think about this. Put that up there. 2 Corinthians 5.21 so people can see it with their own eyes. Can we possibly believe this? Yes. For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't know any sin. He never committed a sin, but he was made to be sin with our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, he became sin with our sin, and we became righteous with his righteousness. That's the place of the great exchange. Then he went into hell, and he paid the price three days and nights. And at the end of that three days and nights, Hebrews 1, verse 6, and all through there you can see where the Lord called him and called him up out of that pit. And when he did, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever. Let all the angels worship you. When he came up out of that pit, don't you know that when he was coming up, Satan screaming, you can't do that, you can't raise him, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. And then the mystery of the ages hid in God was revealed. Yes, it is sin, but it's not his, it's theirs. Now that the sin stays where it belongs, but he's coming out. And so when he rose from the dead, the scripture said we were raised with him. We're made to sit with him in heavenly places, not on your merit, but on his, his righteousness. And so you stand in the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I, I know it's, it's, it's went long today. Woo, it's been a long one. And we get to stand as if we never sinned because of his righteousness and what he paid for. Hallelujah. Now, well, let's, let's go ahead and we'll wind this down now. We have to define now the word revolution. 
Now, I'm going to define it just out of the dictionary, Oxford languages, and so uh, where this one came from. A revolution means a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. Also in the sense of the instance of revolving. It gave the American Revolution, for example. But don't you listen to this definition. It also means, and by the way, in Jesus' time on the earth, everyone thought he was going to bring a, a military-type revolution to the earth. That's why they wouldn't believe him. That's why they wouldn't accept him. But I want you to watch this. A revolution also means a dramatic and wide-reaching change in the way something works or an organized or in people's ideas about it. The Jesus revolution that is about to start will deal with everyone's mind about God, Christianity, religion, love, sin, righteousness, holiness, and godliness. Jesus shook the whole world of religion up with his ideas and his words. But they were all backed up with power. And so is this new move. And so is the church. We're about to shake up everyone's idea about religion, God, sin, righteousness, everything. And I'm telling you, this is why you see the attack on the prophetic prophets. It's to keep the glory from coming. In St. John 1, it's laid out very plain. In the beginning, we covered that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Next, it says, and in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It means it couldn't hold it down and seize on it. That's a war to stop the light. The next thing it says, and there was a man sent from God whose name was John, the time of the prophet. And the Pharisees came and challenged John. And wouldn't listen to him. Religion came against the prophet because the next thing, it's found in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You can't have grace without truth. You can't just say, oh, we're all in grace. And when Jesus rose from the dead, everybody got saved. Everybody's in. I heard asinine teaching like that. said everybody's automatically in the kingdom of God when he rose from the dead. Really? Really? Everybody? Really? What about the Antichrist? Is he in? Is he in? Oh, no, no, the Scripture already says he'll burn like a piece of rubber tire one day. He's not in. You have to have, watch, grace and truth. You can't move in these profound things without the Word itself. What is truth? Jesus said, thy Word is truth. Everything must be balanced here, everything. Everything is subject to this. All prophetic gifts, prophecy, everything subject to this. This is not subject to anything. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That shows you its final authority. The next thing, and in Him was life, and that life was the light. And there was a war, and the darkness tried to hold down the light. But it couldn't hold it down. And then there was prophets. And then after that, the glory. The word, the war, the prophets, and the glory. 
We've arrived at the time. We've arrived at the time. Hallelujah. I don't know if anybody got a lot out of that today, but I, I got a lot out of saying it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was obedient in saying it, but I want you to understand that. Men are not your enemy. Things like that are not your enemy. You're looking at a plan from darkness, darkness trying to hold the light down. And the plan is laid out. The word, the war, the prophets, and the glory. That's the way it's going to work. Why do you think all these programs, uh, um, it's supernatural, um, uh, the Elijah streams and programs like this and different ones, different prophetic programs, all of a sudden, the prophets are talking, boom, 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 and religion comes out, yeah, 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 and prophets talk, boom, 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 yeah, 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 and it just goes on and on because what comes next is the glory, and that's what it's all about to give way to. So don't pay any attention to men. When you hear a vessel speaking, like the Lord said earlier, you have to decide. Wait a minute, what was that? Was that that old wooden ship creaking? Was that a foul of the air squawking? Was that just loose water slapping the boat? Or was that actually the voice of the master talking? And you have to decide. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's been a good 11th hour today. We stand in faith, walk in faith, preach the word, sing the word, talk the word. Hallelujah. Walk in the word. Amen. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do it right now. Don't wait. Just go ahead and do it right now. And, you know, I believe that this rock over here with a face drawn on it is God. You know, don't be an idiot. I mean, just, just, just don't be an idiot. I mean, anything that's, that's in the natural realm is not God. Or it couldn't have done what he did. You have to remember something. Yeah, I, I, will, I, I wanted to tell you something, but he, but he said stop. But a rock or a tree, or a, look at the mighty twig. Somebody pick up a stick and stick it up in the ground, bow to it. You know, don't, don't, don't look, don't look food. You want to tell somebody, get up, man, just get up, get up, get up. Don't do that. Don't do that. That, that really looks silly. That looks silly. You know, that in Paul's day, and, and when he went to, uh, what was it? He went to Athens, I think, and, and right in the middle of the square, they had all this, these false gods everywhere, and they had one more God just in case they didn't cover them all. They had a God to sleep, a God to eat, a God to wake up, a God to go to the bathroom, a God to do anything, a, this God, that God, that God. And they made them all with their hands so they could control them. But just in case, they erected another monument and said, to the unknown God. <laughs> to the unknown God. And Paul said, I perceive above everything else, you're too superstitious. He said, he said I'm going to talk to you about this unknown God who made the heavens and the earth. So you have to remember this. Now you need to remember this. Don't get down and bow to uh, a statue of Buddha. I mean, come on, get up. It looks kind of foolish. Just, just come on, get on up. Just get on up, leave that alone. Don't go out and get you a piece of wood and carve a face and, oh, mighty twig, I'm going to bow to you. You know, that's just, that's stupidity just, on another level. Just leave it alone. Don't, don't look foolish like that. You're embarrassing yourself. What you need to do is come to Jesus, the living God. You know, Buddha's bones are still there. Mohammed's bones are still there. All of them still there. But you, there's, uh, Israel's a place where they go by the millions every year to see a tomb that's empty because he's not there. He's risen like he said. So go to him, the living God. You know, there's been Muslims ask Jesus, if you're real, show me. And he appeared to them, just walked in the room. Well, I don't know if we got scripture on that. Well, the apostle Paul had him appear. Oh, 
God, these people that say, man, we don't know if that's in the Scripture. That's in the, why don't you read it? And don't read it through the eyes of organized religion. And I tell you what, the Assembly of God never said it was in there, and this never said it was in there, and the Baptist church said, my God, that don't exist, and, and all this said, uh, and, and you know, and the seeker friendly says this, and all that, and everybody's saying what everybody says except for what thus saith the Lord. Read it for yourself and let the Holy Ghost talk. There's been Muslim, Islamic people where he just walked through the wall and appeared to them, and you can't convince them he didn't. You mean he walked through the wall? Now, my God, you're getting all bent out of shape here, walking through a wall. Well, he walked through the wall too and appeared to his disciples. Said he came in the room and the door's all being shut. If that's not walking through a wall, I don't know what is. See, it's in there. It's in there. You see that? Don't, don't, don't get so big to cast doubt on someone else because you can't believe what they saw. You can't believe what they saw in the Scripture. It's not of a private interpretation. In other words, a denomination can't fossilize it. Somebody told me one time, said, you know, or I heard somebody say this, said, you put God in a box, he don't like it, he'll get out. He will get out of it. You put him in a box and he'll get out and he'll embarrass you. It'll embarrass you when he gets out because you were sure that's what it was. Don't, don't get all bent out of shape when, when somebody actually believes that something they asked for could be, could be uh, actually created and done. When the Scripture says anything you ask the Father in my name, if I don't have it, I'll make it for you. Well, that means things that you don't have. If you ask Him for it and you believe Him for it, He'll make it for you. There's nothing new under the sun, so that means that it has to exist above the sun somewhere. If there's nothing new under it, there's a brass mountain in heaven. Did you know that? A brass mountain. The Scripture says it. Go look it up. Where's it at? I'm not telling you. I'm not going to do all you studying for you. Go look for it. Go hunt it. A brass mountain. Then you got to let your mind go from there. What grows on a brass mountain? You know everything in heaven's alive. Is it brass trees? Brass grass? What is it? I don't know. Maybe and think about think about the livestock that's on those hills because he owns the cattle of a thousand hills. So is there cattle in heaven? Well, there ain't no cattle in heaven. Really, really. There's four faces that fly around the throne of God, twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. One of them's an ox. So that blew that theology away. Now what about this? There's these 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 pearly gates. I'm not talking about the guitar pickups, pearly gates. <laughs> they're, they're good pickups, though, ain't they, Tommy? But I'm talking about, uh, I don't have that in Judah, but I do have them in some, and it's really nice. They're smooth as silk. But anyway, nobody paid me to say that. And so here, here is the thing. There's these pearly gates on a city that lies 1,500 miles square, high, wide, length, now imagine that pearl, because the Scripture says it's solid pearl. One solid pearl is each gate. Oh, dear Lord. A pearl that size that would fit a city that big. Where'd that come from? You have to ask yourself these things. Maybe it came from that crystal sea that sits out there in front of his throne. Where the, there, imagine the oyster that gave birth to that thing. <laughs> well, that ain't the way it happened. How do you know? How would you know? People, and I'm not talking to our partners. I'm talking to religion. How would you know that didn't happen? I might as well get, I'm trying to get people ready for the revolution. I might as well give you some things that's uh, it's a wild to believe. Have I said anything yet that's not in the Word? No. I've said things that's not in your religious doctrine. 
So when the, Moses came out and crossed the Red Sea, said he held his staff up and crossed the, and parted the sea. Woo, buddy, you talk about something. Hold your prophetic staff out and part the sea. Hallelujah. Somebody get my staff right out there. Get, give me my staff and bring it to me. Hold, hold it out and part the sea. Hallelujah. Woo, what is happening with that, Tommy? Well, let's, let's go further now because we've got to close this 11th hour. We're going to go all day. Hold his staff out and cross the sea. Woo, man. S hold that staff out. My God, what's that man got in his hand? <laughs> My God, what's that in his hand? Well, you know, God asked that to Moses. What you got in your hand? <laughs> he said a staff. He didn't say, you're not supposed to be carrying one of them. <laughs> he just said, cast it down. Let me show you what kind of power is in a prophet's staff. Whoa. And so then he holds it out over the sea, parts the sea. The scripture says that with a blast of God's nostrils, he blew that sea apart, stood it up on each side. 100 to 150 foot walls of water on each side. But it didn't just stop there. The scripture says he breathes out of his nostrils. When God breathes, the frost comes into the earth. Where's that at? I'm not telling you. You go hunt it. And when he breathes, the frost comes. And then the scripture says about the Red Sea parting, says it was congealed in its depths. Where's that in the scripture? I'm not telling you. You go find it. Congealed in its depths. Now look up the word congealed. Oh, it's jello. Jello. Congealed water is gelatin water. It's jello water. And that's what the dictionary says. Have I said anything that's not in the word yet? There's nothing new under the sun. I'm fed up with hearing unbelief. I'll just be straight up with you. This is not going to fit in the revolution because they're going to be some hippies come with some frayed clothing and some. they're going to come with them bell bottoms, man, again. They're going to come out there with them ringlets and hair longer than mine, and they're going to come walking out there. And some of them going to come with buzz cuts and mohawks, and they're going to have tattoos all over their face. And some of them going to put on their body, down their arm, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of the living God. And they're going to have it all over them, and they're going to walk around and show it in church like that, man. And they're going to do it with gauges about that size in their ears and they're going to walk around and you say surely they're not from God and they're going to pull somebody out of a wheelchair that's the way it's going to work hallelujah so we have to get ready to believe everything is in the realm of belief what will you believe do you believe healing is for us do you believe that, that you've been cleansed by his blood well, go ahead now and say it. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus, that you are my Lord. Just do that. Say, I believe in my heart, Lord Jesus, God raised you from the dead. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. And the scripture said if you do that, and you mean that in your heart, you'll be saved. And then go ahead and say, take my life, Lord. Do something with it. Hallelujah. Thank him for cleansing you. And go ahead and just say it. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And he'll start cleaning things up for you. Hallelujah. Praise God.
And they don't stop there. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Get baptized in the Spirit to where when you open your mouth, you can speak in the heavenly language of God. Say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost in fire. And then when you do, just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to speak in tongues now as the Spirit gives me utterance. I believe every utterance I make now is going to be the Holy Ghost giving it to me. That sounds foolish. Really? Really? Just go ahead and let it sound to the world like it needs to sound. But I'll guarantee you, man, they're going to hunt what you got. Amen. Come on, Krista. Tell us how to prosper. Come on up here. Just come up jumping and running. And tell us how to prosper. We want to know God's way how to prosper. Not our way, God's way how to prosper. Because our way usually gets us robbed. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Usually our way gets us, gets something taken. Right. Hallelujah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, it's been, it has been a good 11th hour today. We were, we had... The Lord had some fun with the music today. I I felt like I was caught between Chuck Berry and Leonard Skinner, and I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know where to go with the beats. So I was like, okay, well, we're just gonna we're gonna flow and go. Those that watch Church International Sunday, you know, flow and go. Well, we're going to get ready to receive our offering today. If you want to give, the ways to give are on the screen. And you can also go to robindbullock.com to find out all of those ways also. You know, he was, he was talking and he said, he said that just a second ago about our way usually gets stuff taken from us. Well, he had no idea what I have pulled up on my my phone. I have the scripture of when the thief is caught, you make him pay. Well, in the Amplified, I'm going to pull that up real quick. Now, this is not a long message. I just want to read this to you. It says, but when he is found, he must repay seven times what he stole. He must give all the property of his house, if necessary, to meet his fine. A dear friend of mine and like family texted me today, and we were talking back and forth. Miss Lindsay Roberts, we, we love them, we pray for them, we thank God for them. And she told me something. She said, and, I, and I've always spoken, when I, when I resist the enemy and I always talk to him, I talk to him with authority. But she told me today, she said, I want, she said you need to demand that he repays what he owes you. You demand it. And I said, I texted her back. I said, you know, I said, I said that demanding is something different. It's not just authority. It's not just authoritative words. When you demand something back, and so this is what I pulled up. Now, this is the dictionary, what demand means. It said, an act of demanding, especially with authority. It says something claimed as due or owed. So today, during our offering, we're, we're going to demand that he pay back what he has stolen from you. Because it says when he is found, found him, <laughs> found him, he stole it, that's mine, that's mine right there. It don't take much to find him. It ain't a where's Waldo game. It don't take, it does not take much to find where he's at. He, he's very out in the open, actually. He's, he's actually very out there. You just, he gets you too distracted to find him. But when you're looking like this, boom, got him right there, caught him. He's caught, now he has to pay seven times. So today, 11th hour family, you need to point at the devil and say, in the name of Jesus, I demand 
you to pay me what you owe me and give me back everything that you stole from me in Jesus name now you watch if things don't start changing in your life now this is pertaining not just to finances this is spiritually physically and financially if it's your health demand he pay it back I, I demand it today I demand you pay my health back seven times I will be more healthy in my 30s than I've ever been in my life thus far and I'll keep getting healthier and keep getting healthier. You need to do that for your life. Demand it in your family, what he's stolen from your family. Demand it in your, your businesses. What has he stolen from your business? What has he stolen in your life? Find him, look, and catch him. Just like that. It says you can do that in the Word. It says you can do it in the Word. So, so if we believe it, then we call it done. You have to believe it. And I believe when it says when you when he's found out, when, when, that's right then, when he has to pay it back. There's no, there's no delay. No delays. Right now, right now, pay it all back. We demand it. Just go ahead, call, call it, take this time because it says when he's found, he has to pay it back. So whatever that is, take this time to call it back in your life right now. And watch, watch that, that warehouse door open and that, that storage unit go up and everything in there belongs to you. And it's just coming out like the kid who's stuffed, clean the house, clean the house, and they're just stuffing things in the, the closet when you open it up it, you better get out the way because here it comes <laughs> and that's that's him that's what he does that's what he does he's taking all your stuff and I, I take away your stuff and that's my niece Morgan did that one time you know that kid's got so much wisdom I'm telling you she's just eight years old she was playing like she had stolen my my sunglasses one day and she was about five four or five years old at the time and she said this was her thing she said and I take away your stuff I take away and they're mine forever like that so I look at the devil today and say because that's mine and you think it's yours I take away your stuff I take away and they're mine forever in Jesus name hallelujah well this is a great time to go ahead and give Luke 6 38 says give and it shall be given unto me good measure pressed down shaken together and running over shall men give unto my bosom for with the same measure that I meet with all it shall be measured to me again you say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name now if you're a tither the Lord says I rebuke the devourer for your sake so he looks at him and says I take away your stuff I take away and they're mine forever hallelujah Malachi 3 10 says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call me blessed for I shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name amen so be it Roxanne come on let's let's go out of this 11th hour shout yes hallelujah hallelujah it's time to rejoice with our 11th hour family and what God is doing in your life all across the nation, all across the world. So we got some praise reports today. 
Um, one said uh, recently on one of your broadcasts, and I do believe this was a while back, Prophet Robin Paulston said the Lord would be preventing some home fires. Uh, this word caused me to check some things out, and I discovered that the mesh cover had come off the dryer vent outside, and there was a bird's nest inside, blocking the entire space. The fire department said that's how 80% of fires are caused. So, word to the wise, and thank God for saving our homes, lives, and others. You know, the Lord will prompt you to check some things out because he's trying to reveal something that was meant for your harm. So, praise the Lord that he revealed that. Uh, one partner wrote in and said, uh, my three-year-old daughter was playing last night hide and seek with my oldest daughter, and she was hiding behind the door. When my other daughter opened it, the younger one had her fingers pinched in the hinge of the door. Her two fingers were covered, uh, they were blue, and which I thought was a marker at first, but it was the blood inside of her fingers. We prayed over her and put ice on it, and while icing it, we put the Sunday worship from this past Sunday. We prayed and sang and prayed in tongues for her healing, and we prayed for her fingers to live and hear the word of the Lord. Within 20 minutes, the blueness was gone from her skin, and the color was normal. She can play and is not in any more pain, and the color is still normal to this day with no bruising. And she told us it doesn't hurt anymore. So praise the Lord. Praise God for saving that baby's fingers. And this, this was a praise report, and nothing is too simple to give God praise over. She said, praise, uh, praise God, my son Christian received great favor, and his contract he put forward to his boss was granted. Thank you, Jesus. She said, much love from Ireland. So thank you, Jesus, from everything you're doing from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around the middle. If you can't think of anything to shout over, to give God praise over, to give a praise report about, you woke up this morning, had breath in your lungs, and you were in your right mind. So you can be, or you can claim your victory every day that you get up and you take a deep breath. So hallelujah, thank you for sending your praise reports. Send them to robindbullock.com. Let us know what God is doing in your life so that we can rejoice with you. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes. Yes. That is awesome, awesome, awesome. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been a time of rejoicing, a time of happiness, a time of shouting, and a time of great victory. And I hope everybody realize today that you're on the victory side i'm 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 on the victory side, I'm on the victory side. we need to remember that, that that's the side we're on hallelujah jesus wins he never loses amen well, let me pray over you before we dismiss today. Father, I thank you for the 11th hour family. I thank you for those all around the world, Lord. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have strengthened them in courage, in their minds, give them peace, the peace that passes all understanding. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for them as our partners. And, Lord God, I ask you to make this one more magnificent time for them that they will know the joy of the Lord all around the world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, until next time we gather together right here around God's Word, I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm.